Welcome everyone to this afternoon's session. My name is Deanne Liska and I'm pleased to be opening the session to provide some context to the issue. This session was developed with the collective input of the IFN's lipids and food and chemical toxicology committees to inform the program work that will follow from today's discussions. So we know that these two groups are listening with an attentive ear. So these are my disclosures. And the program has three segments, opening with some thought starter presentations on the topic, followed by a facilitated discussion, which will include additional representatives from public and private sectors, as you can see here. And finally, we will open up for audience Q&A. So please enter your questions at any time over the course of the session. And with that, I'll kick off the session with an introduction to this topic. So I think we all know um, some of the flip-flops that when we use that term flip-flops, what we're talking about in particular, the diet hypothesis that led to avoiding butter and having margarine and then um, avoiding fat and, and increasing um, carbohydrate intake, et cetera. So some of these we'll probably hear about in some of the discussions later. Um, but a couple of the topics that I thought were interesting in some of what the consumers are seeing is we are what we eat, which I think we're recognizing that diet plays a big role in, in health, um, our health trajectory and in managing health. But also 99% of what we eat is a mystery. Um, I don't know if it's 99%. But um, we don't have all of the information on even what's in the foods we eat, let alone the potential impacts of, of ingredients, especially in the context in which we eat them. So we're often making decisions with imperfect data to, to start with. So um, that makes it a very challenging when we, when we make choices and um, make changes to the food supply. But one of the biggest drivers to the change that, and again, that we've seen over time has been the understanding that that um, a lot of healthcare expenditures are for chronic health conditions. And in this case, this is from the CDC site most recently, where they look at chronic and mental health conditions, and then talk about lifestyle, diet, and other things that can have, um, people can do to affect these. But we, we know that six in 10 adults in the US have a chronic disease, four in 10 have two or more, and we mostly focus on, it seems, lipids and hypertension, although chronic disease is a broader topic. But this has gained attention in policy as well, and certainly that's affected our food um, initiatives and food supply with respect to dietary guidelines, focusing very much on chronic disease, preventing chronic disease, and helping further manage um, chronic disease, but also an understanding now that um, dietary intakes are um, very based on people's health among other things and that we need to have different way of looking at um, even our reference dietary intakes. So even looking today and saying we're making foods that meet nutrient um, levels for people with a chronic disease, though that may change in the future if we have changes to the dietary reference intake in terms of what people really need who are living with different um, chronic conditions. Another aspect of this is that um, few chronic diseases are affected by a single nutrient or pathway. So very complex, um, you change one thing, but it's part of a system. So we, we need to um, shift over to systems thinking. And these are discussions I know we've been having in the nutrition science field for quite a while, but how to do that is a challenge. Another, um, um, but, um, I, another point that shows the increased role that diet and nutrition play um, in health and, is our national research agenda and the NIH putting out a nutrition research strategic plan. And in this plan, I thought what was interesting were the strategic goal questions. They, they came up with four basic questions. And if we tweak these a little, some of these are questions that we need and many of you probably already do ask about um, changes that as they happen you know how do we eat and what does it um how does it affect us many companies have information on consumers who's eating the food how is it affecting them how does it fit into their daily diet um how does it fit into dietary patterns and behaviors and for optimal health um but how does what we promote health across the lifespan well, another thing about chronic disease and looking at health is that we're looking at some changes we make today with the idea that they're going to affect us in 20 or 30 years. 
and we often don't have that type of data. So this requires modeling and as part of the strategic nutrition plan, there's a focus on identifying, getting better data, identifying the, the key needs in the data, but also having better data science, system science, and AI. So we will require um, understanding how to model better. But a real challenge to, I think, food companies that are making ingredients that go into multiple types of foods is that food systems are global. And when you're working with ingredients, then they are play out in many different ways. Um, whereas nutrition is, we're seeing more and more is individual. So if you're looking at individual foods, like foods for health, and for a specific population, you can be more targeted and, and have a better idea, maybe predict better the impact of that food. But when you're looking at an ingredient, putting an ingredient as a food supply, it could be used in many different ways across the food system. So that, that adds another complexity to these types of questions. Um, important to companies, of course, are consumer expectations. Um, and we know for many years now, taste price, they just don't change. They're the top drivers. Healthfulness has um, increased over time but not increase a lot, it's, it's slowly tweaking up. Um, but we also see convenience is very important. And I, I remember when convenience was higher than healthfulness. And so there has been some change there. Um, and environmental sustainability is making its way onto the list as well. So those are factors that when making changes, those are certain areas that the consumer's um, concerned about when they make decisions. And we need to think those through as well, which I'm sure this is data from IFIC, and they've been collecting this data for a while, and most companies look at these types of questions. Um, but just to point out that healthfulness continues to rise in importance to consumers, so we um, continue to focus on the healthfulness of food. And I thought this was an interesting report. Um, it's from Mintel, and it's on the chronic health consumer. And what I think is really interesting about this, it, even though it's more medical or the medical field focused, but it did talk a little bit about food. And um, a couple points. One is the chronic health managers are starting younger. So this also points to the nutrition outcome and the health outcome of food is getting more attention and, and will likely get even more in the future because 35% of consumers 18 to 34 are managing chronic health, uh, managing for chronic health. Um, but another point that I think is no surprise to many companies that most consumers um, are not looking to change their own habits. You know, they don't, they'd rather look to a prescription product or something that they, they consume in that way. So brands, this continues to talk about the challenge in focusing on health forward habits that prevent worsening and being a challenge for brands. Um, but it does point out that with COVID-19, we don't know the impact of that because people with chronic health now have an at-risk label. And in terms of being more at risk for serious complications, and, and there was just much more news about that. Will that even further the focus on needing to think about health outcomes of, of food choices? I thought this quote was really um, interesting. Lifestyle choices are an integral component to managing chronic illness, yet many chronic health managers are focused more on medication than building health habits, which is one of the reasons I think one of the, the key reasons why there's been a focus on changing the food supply for, for um, health outcomes, um, because it's hard to get people to change their habits. But innovations in alternative treatment of functional foods have a place in disease management and prevention, but must build trust and acceptance and be easy to incorporate. So there's an understanding too that this has to be easy for consumers. So as buying power shifts, so um, ethical considerations also have come into play. And that's another um, trend that we've seen. And this, again, is from a, a mental report. This is a, about food ethics. And it may seem a little bit out of the focus of um, the topic here where it's flip-flops on health, unless you think that the term health is changing, what we mean by health. And I have the next slide. I'll talk a little about that. But in terms of um, the focus, 18 to 54 year olds, much more focused on what is considered ethical aspects. And this lists some of the aspects that were looked at and considered for ethical, and it includes sustainability, um, ethical labor practices, animal welfare, et cetera. So in considering buying food and considering um, buying food for health reasons, younger consumers are 
the 18 to 54 younger consumers are, are um, taking into account other factors as well when they think about that. And that shows that we've gone, you know, from the beginning of my career where we were talking about how do we feed the world enough calories and enough basic vitamins like vitamin A, et cetera, to how do we um, prevent and help better manage um, health um, issues like chronic disease. And so we've gone to, for the last two decades or so, a real focus on obesity and heart health and these sorts of things. But most recently now, we're talking about health in another context, that's planetary health. How do we do all of that and at the same time, think about the planet and the health of the planet, which gets to the ethical considerations as well. So when we change the food supply, what the consumer expectation is broader than just what impact does this have on me personally, or what is in, impact does this have on mal, you know, people who are malnourished in another country? They're thinking on planetary health. And this is not gonna notice from our National Academies of Sciences as well. Um, a number of reports, the cost of food report, which was in 2012, um, this um, had this quote, the US food system provides many benefits, not the least of which is a safe, nutritious, and consistent food supply. However, the same system creates significant environmental, public health, and other costs that are generally not recognized and not accounted for in the retail price of food. And as we shift um, and change, make changes of food supply, what I've been seeing is it's these other aspects, environmental, public health, and these other points that people are judging that change on. Was that change actually beneficial? And that does lead to some of these ideas of, a, of where we get flip-flops because in the food supply change may have been for one reason, which was to make a better individual food that has a better nutritional profile. But if it doesn't affect you know, a beneficial or at least neutral environmental or public health outcome, then that's, the, that's where the judgment comes and the flip-flops often come into play. The cost of food report was followed by um, a much um, bigger report on a framework for assessing effects of the food system, which really deals with this. If we're going to change, make changes in the food system, if we're going to make dietary recommendations that will change how people eat. We need to be thinking more broadly than we have been in the past. And, that, and I'll have a, the next slide on that. But subsequent to that were a couple of workshops, one that actually just published very recently here. Um, that really relate back to the framework and they talk about but what does it mean to do this and and basically how do we do this and the framework came up with um, a shift to systems thinking where they talk about having all the stakeholders thinking more interdisciplinary um, but looking at changes in the food supply to include questions around what's the impact potential impact on human health potential impact on environmental and agriculture on social and economic health and what I liked about this report is it actually talked about there are trade-offs. And the subsequent workshops actually talk about, well, how do we do this? You know, there's a lot of um, discussion now in, about these are the things we need to think about, these are the things we need to address, and there were some examples in this particular report. But it's not like anybody has a checklist or a formula. So how do you, and I think it gets back to how do we avoid flip-flops? Well, I don't know if there's a checklist. It may be there's, we, we have to think more about how do we manage the, the issues or, or monitor to help manage and be resilient about the changes that may need to happen because of the, the um, unexpected or unintended consequences of a, of a change the, uh, to a food, food supply. So um, another thing in this report is we need to really be clear about the assumptions and boundaries, especially in modeling, because again, we're, we're doing a lot of prediction and modeling when we're trying to figure out what, what um, effect some change is gonna have. And unless we know the assumptions, a lot of times it's the underlying assumptions are that are changing or the underlying data in developing those models. And we don't always take that into account. So I think the mandate is clear that to really deal with food supply changes, we need to think more broadly, but how to do that is anything but clear. And we're not the only groups talking about this right now. This has become a real major focus is how do we better understand and predict what, what's gonna happen when we make changes. So we do have some lessons um, learned from past experiences. And I think I mentioned, and I don't need to go over 
too much detail, the um, um, diet heart health hypothesis that led to um, a focus on SAT fat, led to trans fat, replacing it. And then when trans fat was seen as not being the, the answer, um, there ended up being uh, you know, a shift more to carb high diets and, and such. Um, and this has been looked at in, in quite detail and, and there's a lot of um, histories and doc, you know, a lot of information on this. But we just need to understand that every time we make a, a change, when we look at a single ingredient, the consumer is actually substituting. They're not just taking something out of their diet, but they're substituting. And so any of our modeling and predictions of what might happen with the change need to account for how is the consumer really going to make that change. And we also, I think, um, need to understand that we don't have all the data. So um, when we do make a change, it might affect one outcome, um, but it might also affect another in a positive way, but it might affect another outcome in another in a negative way. And we don't really understand you know, what is the ultimate from all of that. So that's where we get a lot of challenges in what really happens in the real world. Another thing that we know is that baseline has changed over time and much of our data, and this is a, a graph that's looking at uh, trans fat intakes, um, percent of energy from trans fat, and that should be from trans fat compared to cis muffa in terms of studies. And there was a, certainly when margarine was, was consumed at a much higher level, um, intakes were much higher and um, much of the data, almost entirely all the data comes from very high intakes, which were um, within the range of what people were consuming prior to FDA labeling. But once FDA had trans fat labeling, um, baseline, in, the intakes in the consumer population went way down. So that was a real successful labeling. But it does mean that when we look at data, if we're looking at what kind of a change we're actually going to see in a population, we need to start from where the population is right now in terms of consumption. And many of the um, studies that we're looking at, the, the baselines best represent what we're actually seeing in people today. So in terms of expectations and how this change is going to affect health, and that's true of, of um, many intakes that we look at as we change. Um, the Innovations of Food System Report actually had a speaker who um, talked a little bit about protein changes. And it was you know, a brief discussion, but some of the, the considerations that need to be taken into account um, very briefly, but also gave this example. So I just want to say this is where the, this data comes from. It comes from that report. The products may be a little bit different now, but this is ground beef versus uh, two um, newer products at the time. And so they may have changed a little in consumption, but Beyond Beef and Impossible Burger and then and Amy's um, product. And just to point out, we also know that as we change in one, you know, these are protein and they're consumed for protein but they have big differences in contribution of sat fat and sodium and many other nutrients and we really need to understand what are the other nutrient um, changes that go along with this one change you change for one reason but there are other impacts as well and some of those are known and i'd have to say i think many of them are not known at this point um but because of this there may be when you look across the nutritional profile overall you may end up with a change that really is neutral from a personal health perspective. And so I think we also need to be clear of what is the expectation? Are you really going to change personal health or are, is this about planetary health? Because when we talk health, I think we have different definitions and, and it gives different expectations to the field and to people, um, to the consumer. So a recent report um, or review talked through, it's a perspective that talks through the, um, the transition to tra plant-based diets and actually talked about some of these different aspects and really goes through a discussion that says, you know, there are, this really represents there are trade-offs. And in terms of the plant-based protein to, um, um, from animal-based protein, um, there are no nutritional contributions that we can talk about and whether it's similar or different. There may be absorption differences, and we have limited information on that, but it, um, there's some suggestion that iron isn't absorbed the same 
And there may be benefits to chronic health, but not obesity. And I think we, we need to be clear about what do we actually know about health outcomes? And then many components that are not known. So that's an example um, that's looking at, well, how do we um, look at what information there is when we make these types of changes? But they also suggest um, that as we make these changes, dietary modeling, which is required to really try to predict, should consider sustainability, but carefully and comprehensively, individual nutrient needs within dietary intake, dietary adherence, and dietary substitutions. So similar to some of our lessons learned. And they also propose that research in the future really should be conducted on, the, on these that have more stratified interventions. They support um, personal palatability and preferences and personalized dietary intervention schemes. Again, we're getting more personalized in everything. So I end up with more questions than answers. I think I was asked, you know, if you had a checklist, what would it be? And I, I don't know, but I think as we have food supply changes intended to benefit health, we need to consider the human, the environmental, social, and economic aspects of those along with the consumer drivers. And, you know, the difference, um, the level of those considerations will be different if we're looking at an ingredient that's gonna be used across the food supply versus targeted products or targeted um, types of approaches. Um, we need to consider multiple stakeholders um, because there will be trade-offs and we need to balance those trade-offs. And understanding those balanced decisions and communicating um, uh, clearly with that, with those um, potential issues and trade-offs um, could help with consumer trust in the food supply. And I also think we need to understand that past data can form, but needs to be put in perspective of today's consumer. And there's a lot of data that we probably need to just relook at and probably need to redo in, in light of what we know about today's consumption patterns and, and expectations um, as well. And so with that, um, I thank you for listening to this talk and um, to share additional perspectives. We will now shift to our two speakers, Dr. Sarah Berry, and Dr. Brian Delaney, and I'll introduce each in turn. Dr. Berry is a senior lecturer at King's College London, where she started her research career in 2000. Dr. Berry has interests in the influence of dietary components on markers of cardiovascular disease risk, and has made a leading contribution to the knowledge base on the influence of interesterification of triacylglycerols in postprandial metabolism. Following Dr. Berry will be Dr. Brian Delaney. Dr. Delaney has focused his career on the safety assessment of food ingredients, working at Frito-Lay, Cargill, and DuPont. After transferring to the pioneer business of DuPont, now Cortiva, he was promoted to research fellow and served in that role for 16 years. Since 2019, Dr. Delaney has been working as a senior toxicologist at Fermanich SA, following or focusing on safety assessment of flavorings and fragrances. Dr. Berry, we'll turn it over to you, followed by Dr. Delaney. And again, thank you. I'm Dr. Sarah Berry from King's College London, and thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. So I'm going to talk about the challenges when assessing the health effects of new ingredients in the very changing food supply that we find ourselves in. And from a research perspective, I'm going to focus on the work I've been doing on intrasterified oils to give us a kind of case study. So the outline of the talk is really going to be around some really key questions. Where are we now? What are the questions we need to be asking? What is helpful and what's not helpful? And then, like I said, I'll, I'll focus for the last five minutes really on a case study of this interest terrified work. And I'm also going to look along the way about the, some of the challenges that we face as researchers uh, around addressing the health effects of new ingredients. So to kick off, where are we now? Well. We're rather confused. Things haven't really changed much in terms of our understanding or general consumer understanding of the health effects of different fats and oils. And I think this is a really nice illustration of the kind of adverts that we've seen over the years where one minute we're saying butter's good for us, the next we're saying, you know, ha have uh, oils because they're low in saturated fat, then we're back to eating butter. Well, where are we now? Now I think that we're in the midst of what I call this big fat debate that there's a lot of miscommunication and there's a lot of misunderstanding. 
And even world leading experts don't agree on the healthiness of common foods or the healthiness of fats. So how can we actually all agree then on the health effects of new fats? And this illustration here shows some work that I did a couple of years ago where we asked 13 world leading nutrition experts to rate 105 different foods on their healthiness. And the ones that are showing the red squares are the ones that they rated most health, unhealthy and the ones with the green squares the most healthy. Now, if everyone agreed, so if our 13 top world class nutritionists all agreed, we'd expect all the bars um, uh, uh, on the Y axis to be the same color. But as you can see in the middle here, there's a huge area where we have a mixture of both red and green, showing that even world leading experts don't agree. And if we look at what these specific foods are, a lot of these are foods containing mixtures of uh, added fats, added oils, or added spreads. And the reason for this is because we're complicated and food are complicated. And we all respond differently to the same food. And this is because each and every one of us has thousands of different biological pathways. Every food has thousands of different chemicals and these chemicals interact and they're also modulated by the very complex food matrix they're in. And so if we collide the complexity of us and the complexity of food, it stands to reason that we're all gonna respond very differently to the same food, which makes studying therefore the health effects of food very difficult. And also given that we now understand that food is more than just its simple nutrients, that it is modulated, like I said, by the complex matrix it's in, as well as the other nutrients, this adds even more challenges to when we study their health effects. And alongside that, we need to consider, as I mentioned, should we be studying the effects at the individual or at the population level? Now, this is because, like I've said, we all respond differently to the same food and we're starting to really understand that the mean may not be actually all that meaningful when we're trying to look at, at how a particular food or ingredient impacts a particular health outcome. Now, nutritional studies typically in the past have shown the mean response. And if I use uh, the results from one of my intrasterified studies as an example, what you can see here is the tag concentration after consuming either palm oil or intrasterified palm oil and the change in that over an eight hour period. And you can see this shows that actually there's pretty much no difference between either the palm oil or the intrasterified palm oil. But how many of us are average? If we then look, this is a study in 50 people at each and every individual uh, person's response. So all 50 people's response, you can see each individual's line here. And this shows firstly how variable our response is to these different fats. It shows as well that we need to look beyond the mean and we need to therefore be careful when we're thinking about nutrition advice based on population averages or from nutrition studies, just looking at the mean response. And I've tried to quantify this. So what I've done is, each one of these bars here is one individual from this 50 people study and their overall tag response shown from that curve. And what you can see here on the left is these people down here, they, their tag response favors palm oil. What you can see here on the right, their tag response favors intrasterified palm oil. So how can we therefore make meaningful recommendations at a population level as to whether these people are better eating palm oil or better eating intrasterified palm oil? It's gonna be a challenge and it is a challenge. Now, we're at a really uh, important transition in nutritional science and I think a really fortunate time that you know, we can actually, and we must capitalize on the many new technologies that we are able to use in nutritional research that actually enable us for the first time to be able to look beyond the mean response. Um, and how we research the health effects of foods and fats and ingredients therefore is really changing in my opinion. So typically we have relied in nutritional research on very low quantity, so small, but very high quality and high precision trials, such as the very traditional randomized controlled trials. Or we've relied on the very high quantity, so um, vast amounts of people, but at very low quality and very low precision, the kind of data you get from epidemiological or cohort studies. But we're now at this exciting time, I think, where we have these new research opportunities where we can capitalize on digital devices, for example, you know, clinical devices like continuous glucose monitoring or, or um, remote clinical testing from dry blood spot testing or microbiome or DNA testing. 
and also this exploding area of citizen science. Everyone wants to know more about their health. Everyone wants to know, or well, most people, how nutrients impact um, their health, how they can make them live longer, healthier, younger, etc. And I think that we're at this exciting time now where we can get quality, precision, depth, breadth, and quantity, and we must capitalize on this as researchers. And I think this is really going to make the path a lot easier and the journey a lot easier when we're looking at establishing uh, favorable or unfavorable health outcomes from new ingredients or fats. So where else are we now? Well, another big change I think is we've shifted from looking at nutrient only focused guidelines. And we're now really understanding the importance of food-based dietary guidelines. And there's a lovely review by Arnie Allstrup that was published last year that really talks about this in depth. If we take saturated fatty acids as an example, previous advice has recommended we restrict saturated fatty acids to reduce cardiovascular disease risk. But actually, we now know that the health effects of saturated fatty acids, and the same applies for all types of fatty acids as well as many other food ingredients, depends on the interacting effect, effects from other um, ingredients in the food, from other fatty acids, from other nutrients, and most importantly, also from the matrix, the food matrix in which that food is delivered. And so really recommendations, but also how we study the effect of an ingredient or a fat should really focus on either on food-based strategies in terms of recommendations and food-based ingredients and food-based approaches to how we research as well the health effect of any given ingredient or fat. So moving on, what are the right questions we therefore need to actually ask? Well, I think the most important thing, and I will touch on this in a slide on its own, is instead of what, what is the fat being replaced with? I think we need to think about the dose. Are we using realistic doses or should we use proof of principle doses when we're studying the health effects of fat? Or should we do a dose response study? We should be looking at the pattern of consumption and the frequency of consumption. We should be looking, like I've mentioned a few times, at the food matrix effect. So what food will the fat actually be in? How does the matrix affect the, the health response uh, to that fat? Also, who's consuming the food? We need to select a suitable study population, or we need to decide whether we want to look at a susceptible subgroup, or we want to look at those with the highest intake. Ideally, we would do all three. And then I think that a right question to also ask is the mechanism of action. And this will really inform the duration, the time scale of the studies, whether we want to do chronic or acute, as well as you know, the intricacies of any study protocol. We also have many challenges though that we do have to face. And these are, how can we measure long-term impacts within a short period of time? We have to be realistic. We can't introduce a new fat, a new ingredient, and then monitor it for the next 50 years. We don't have the luxury of that time. How can we as nutritional researchers as well balance our wish list? And my wish list for any of my studies is uh, incredibly long, I can assure you. How can we balance this against costs? So all of the different outcomes we want to measure, we have to be realistic. What are we funded to look at? We also need to think a little bit carefully about how we use epidemiological evidence. And I think this is something that we've relied on very much in terms of thinking about the health effects of dietary fat um, in the past. And I think that we need to move beyond this because I think that this has blurred the lines a little bit for us. We also need to think about how we can disentangle the many integrated determinants and responses of the fat. Like I pointed out in the earlier slide, there's so many factors that are important. There's the how we are, the who we are, the, the how we eat it. Um, you know, that are all have an interplay to modulate how each and individual of us will respond to a given ingredient or fat. And something else, and that will have been touched on earlier, that I think is really important is how can we balance also consumer perception that in the food industry, it's all very well developing a novel ingredient, but we have to be mindful of how acceptable it will be to individuals. And there was some work I did a couple of years ago where we asked a couple of thousand people in the UK about their perception of fats, whether they viewed them as healthy or unhealthy. And the results are shown here on the left. Obviously, or, or you know, as expected, everyone viewed, or most people viewed omega-3 fats as healthy. But what's interesting is if you look down here, 
same amount of people viewed fully hydrogenated and partially hydrogenated as healthy. And so this shows that there's still that lack of understanding, the fact that they viewed both of these as healthy and, and the fully hydrogenated are still not accepted. So I mentioned that what I think is the most important thing is instead of what. So the way we eat food isn't just a single nutrient. We eat foods, we eat dietary patterns. So if we are to change one nutrient in a food, then it changes, it's swapping something out, it's replacing something else. And we need to consider what it is that's being displaced and replaced. And this is really nicely illustrated by this meta-analysis. It is about uh, six years old, so I know there's been more recent ones, but I think this visually shows it quite simply. So this study shows that if you uh, change saturated fatty acids by equivalent energy from either trans, MUFA, PUFA, or different types of carbohydrates, this is the change that you have in the risk of heart disease. And what this shows is if you change saturated fatty acids for trans fatty acids, there's no change in the risk. If you change it for MUFA or PUFA, you have a really beneficial impact. So you have a favorable reduction in risk. If you change it for refined carbohydrates, again, you have no change. Now, this could be reported anyway. So imagine I could report this study in a newspaper saying, you know, reducing or saturated fat has no impact on cardiovascular risk. Well, actually they're right if the comparator is trans or refined carb. But I could also say reducing saturated fat has a huge impact on reducing your risk of heart disease, which is also right if we're replacing MUFA and PUFA. And I think this really nicely illustrates how we must think of instead of what. But we must also think of it not just at the single nutrient level that we've looked at, but also about this food source of fat. So there's still that added layer of complexity that we need to be very careful. It's not just the displacement nutrient, it's the displacement food. So what's not helpful? Well, again, I'm going to show learnings from uh, some of the work we've done on intrasterified fats. It's not helpful to look at an irrelevant displacement fat. There was a study that was conducted in 2007 by Casey Hayes, a very good study, but they compared an intrasterified fat that was very, very solid versus a uh, semi-solid palm oleum. The intrasterified fat was shown to have unfavorable health effects but they would never be used interchangeably. So it was a really irrelevant comparison to make. And unfortunately, on the back of the study, we saw these kind of adverts being pushed where these fats are more dangerous than trans fats. Yet, it, in my opinion, it was just, it, it was such an irrelevant comparison to make. We also, what's also not helpful is to look at the fat when it's not within the appropriate food matrix that it would be in real life. And also what's not helpful is to make unattainable promises. About four years ago, a leading retailer in the UK called Iceland made a promise to remove all palm-based products uh, and remove all palm oil from any of their products. And they had this wonderful TV campaign where this girl was in love with this um, orangutan and really playing on people's emotions. Within six months, I had to do a, a total U-turn on this because it just wasn't possible. They were either going to replace it with a less healthy oil or an oil that was worse for the environment um, and or an incredibly expensive fat. And so we do have to be mindful of these kind of things just not being helpful. And also, in my opinion, something else we have to be very careful of is how we interpret and how we use animal studies because we now know that animals metabolize fat just a little bit differently. And so studies like this that show that intrasterified palm oil produces greater apogenicity, which is shown by the um, cross sections here, the arteries compared to native palm oil. Yes, fine, it shows us in mice, but does this apply to humans? In my opinion, probably not. So I'm gonna spend the last two minutes um, using a case study from the work we've been doing on intrasterified fats to show it is possible. Let's not be disheartened despite these challenges it is possible to actually answer these important questions and um, put everything into a real context. So, and I've broken this down into a few phases. This is some work that we've been doing over the last 10 years. And the first phase of this work was to put into context how, what, who, in order to inform the study design. So the first thing that we looked at is the food matrix effects. What products are they in so that we could select the appropriate food matrix to feed these fats? The second thing we looked at, what are they being consumed? What's being replaced? What are they being consumed instead of? 
And the third thing we looked at is how much do we consume and who is consuming these fats? In the interest of time, I'm not going to go into these in details, but we do have a review published in the details are here on the bottom right corner that you can look at and delve into in a bit more deeply at your leisure. Then the next phase of this work was to look at the proof of principles and the underpinning mechanisms. And this was looking in this instance at how does an intrasterified hard stock, so this is almost like a mega dose compared to a non intrasterified hard stock. And we looked at this using a whole series of randomized crossover double blind studies and also in vitro modeling. The next phase to this work, and bear in mind when I'm talking about this work and my intrasterified work, I believe this could be applied to most fats um, and ingredients, is to take it to the real life scenario. So look at our new fat versus functionally equivalent alternatives. And this is really important to use functionally equivalent alternatives and really is a nod back to the, the critique I had about the study that Casey Hayes undertook where it wasn't a functionally equivalent alternative. And again, we've done a series of randomized control trials doing this. The phase four is really to take it to that next step to look at short-term and long-term effects of the fats. So use real life doses, so you look in different food matrix that are relevant. And again, we must compare against an alternative functionally equivalent fat. So we've been doing lots of work using bakeries and spreads and different doses. Again, there isn't time to go into all of this work in detail, but there is a, a review that uh, covers most of this work that we've been doing. So in summary, yes, we can avoid the health flip-flops in the changing food supply that we find ourselves in. But what we must be really mindful of is that academia and industry must work together. And I haven't had time really to go into how important this has been in my research, but I think that this is the foundation of really what, what we need to springboard. We must be careful when extrapolating from epidemiological studies. We must, as I've said, use functionally equivalent fats as a comparator. We also need to combine mechanistic acute chronic studies in both the clinic and at home using all of these novel technologies. And as I hope I've been able to emphasize, I think it's really important that we think about who, so who's eating this fat, what they're eating in place of, and what they would be alternatively displacing and facing, and how they're eating this fat. So in what food, in what dietary pattern. And I think a parting thought uh, um, from the picture on the right shows that I, I hope you do see that we have made huge leaps and huge bounds in nutrition research over the last 50 years or so. And I think that we're now at an exciting time where we're really pushing the fast forward button on nutrition research. And with that, I'd like to, to thank you and hand over to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for um, inviting me here to talk to you today about uh, the safety assessment of interesterified fats. And what we're going to talk to uh, today about is uh, just a little bit about the traditional approach to toxicology and food ingredient safety and how those methods could apply and have been applied uh, to interesterified fats. And uh, just for purposes of disclosure here, I, I work for a private company, so I don't have any grants or research support. Um, I am an editor in the Elsevier Journal Food Chemical Toxicology, uh, but note everything else is my, uh, my employer is, uh, is Furnish, uh, so it's based in Geneva, Switzerland. So a brief outline then of the topics I wanted to cover. And again, it's a, a brief presentation today, so I won't go into a lot of detail with the first parts here, since uh, these are going to be discussed probably by some of the other speakers. But just discuss briefly what are interesterified fats, why are they used, then we'll talk more about the grass approach and uh, share some conclusions after we discuss that. So. To, to begin right away, then what exactly are interesterified fats? And as the name implies, they're triglycerides that have modified and rearranged the fatty acids on the glycerol backbone. And it's typically a blend of saturated fat with vegetable oil and uh, polyunsaturated fats. And so you can accomplish this interesterification through chemical means, uh, sodium methoxide, and, uh, for example, uh, and high temperature can result in the random rearrangement, but the high temperature can also lead to a loss of oil and tocopherols. So another possible method to produce them is using immobilized lipases uh, for structure rearrangements and lower temperature fewer side reactions. And so if you were to look at what they look like from a chemical structure, the, uh, the chemical structure uh, right here, for example, is typical triglyceride. And when you do the random chemical mediated interesterification, you can have a 
broad outcome of different structures, mainly by moving the different uh, fatty acid side chains uh, around here attached to the glycerol backbone. Similarly, if you do the uh, mobilized lipase approach, you could cause a more specific rearrangement of these, uh, these components here. And uh, again, I do not consider myself an expert in interesterified fats, so I'm not going to discuss more uh, about how to produce them and characterize them, but this is in essence what we're talking about. And so the question then becomes, why are they used? What do you, what do, you do with them? And the answer is uh, it's a replacement for trans fats, which uh, as of June, 2018 are off limits in the United States and uh, they're used for functional purposes because they're solid at room temperature. And the food use categories that you find them is going to be in confections, frostings, soft candy, sweet sauces, and these generic, of course, you'll always see others as uh, as determined by the uh, the developer. And so these these are some of the the broad categories you'll find the uh, interesterified fats in. So now, if we jump over to the, uh, the the second part of the title here, let's just talk about the grass approach to safety assessment. And so beginning here with what what is uh, directly from the CFR. And if you look at what's uh, the, the the core of what's uh, the concept of grass, it's a reasonable certainty in the minds, of competent scientists that the substance is not harmful under intended conditions of use. That's a really important point. It is impossible, this is another important point, impossible in the present state of scientific knowledge to establish with complete certainty that absolute harmlessness of the use of any substance. And so uh, again, we'll talk about this a little bit in the next slide. But the for me, the point of emphasis is that uh, this isn't really a check the box approach. You can't just say, if you get the following components, you're going to be grass. It just doesn't work that way. And when you look at it, though, for example, uh, from the business perspective, and I deal with this quite often, and uh, people who work in the food industry probably have, uh, if they're toxicologists, dealt with this from, from the business side. And it's not necessarily a criticism. It's just uh, it's maybe not a full understanding of uh, the limitations of what we can do with grass. Because the wanted conclusion, again, from the business perspective, is that the ingredient is safe. So what I have often seen uh, over my years of doing this is that if somebody will, in the business side or technical side, will say, well, if it's safe for use in uh, broths, then it's also going to be safe for use in, um, you know, let's say, bread or, or confession, something like that. And, you know, literally, it doesn't really work that way. And so just because something is grass does not mean it's just safe for everything. So the opinion I sort of use, this is sort of, it's not overkill, but it is a little overkill. And this is, again, I would stress this is this is my conclusion, opinion of the presenter. The actual conclusion from grass is that following analysis of scientific data by persons qualified to evaluate the data, then the ingredient, when produced as described, with the defined and reproducible methods, meaning specified composition profile, including unintentional ingredient, ingredients, contaminants, impurities, is safe for addition to an often narrow range of foods for specific purposes at levels defined in the assessment. And so it's a longer winded version of saying, yes, it's safe, but we typically develop a product for to fit the applications. And this does not mean it's a safe for addition to any food category to any concentration that we choose. I mean, you probably will have to go back and, and expand the categories of use and do some more exposure modeling if you want to expand it in different categories. So then, and I realize I said there's not a check the box approach, which is why I put this together here, was that if you really look at the grass approach, there are some elements you will find in essentially uh, every single grass approach. You're going to see history of safe use. And that, for, for example, this would be, uh, does this uh, substance, is it present in nature? Does it come from an apple, an orange, or lemon, whatever? Can you establish that the source has, been, has a history of safe use? You're also going to have to discuss method of production. And this is large to account for um, possible impurities or residual solvents, for example, things like that. Uh, also, if you do a chemical synthesis as opposed to using biotechnology, you can have regulatory implications. You will always see physical and chemical properties of the substance, you know, melting point, things like that. Really, a particularly important component of this, this approach too is the composition. You want to be able to define what, the, what your product is. And in fact, if you see um, I've noticed more in my editorial work than in my day-to-day -day work that this is typically what gets papers, uh, scientific papers, rejected from food and chemical toxicology is if the, uh, the persons who submit them do not have a detailed composition analysis of the test substance. 
uh, speaks to the question of the quality of the methods you're using to produce it, as well as potential for introducing unintended risks. Um, also for reproducibility. I mean, if you have a substance that's 80% pure in one batch and 99% in another, then the results may or may not, of any toxicology studies may or may not apply to each batch. And so we also have toxicology data, but also you'll see in the GRASS approach that the applicant will say where they want to use them, which food categories and what concentration. Also do an exposure assessment. But my, my point from presenting the data in this manner is that if you really look at the, the entirety of the data that has to be considered for a GRASS approach, toxicology is a relatively small component. And it's an important component. And there's quite a bit of data that often is going to be considered with the toxicology data. And we're going to talk about that here in this slide. And again, what you normally would expect to see would be evidence of genotoxicity, typically a forward and reverse mutation assay. And I wrote toxicokinetics here, but that can also be reduced to bioavailability and determining if the test substance is more or less likely to reach the systemic circulation. You will see a comparison to similar substances in most cases. And you will also see oftentimes toxicology studies, you know, acute probably for the purposes of labeling and repeated dose to identify the no observed adverse effect level. Clinical trials, if available, can be used, and then you'll use all this information to uh, conduct a risk assessment and derive an acceptable daily intake. And so typically, um, when you apply these, these methods, you can see that they have been applied to numerous interesterified, uh, interesterified oils. And if you go to the FDA graphs notice inventory, you'll see a number of them in there. But where, where it gets a little bit more confusing is that some of the adverse effects that people have cited with oils, fats, including interesterified oil, they might not necessarily be even evaluated in grass repeated dose studies. Uh, for example, some of the fats have been reported to increase blood glucose, uh, raise LDL cholesterol, and reduce HDL cholesterol. Well, those are variables that we do look at in an OECD guideline repeated dose toxicology study. However, some of the other components, uh, some of the other potential adverse effects that have been uh, reported with, uh, with the different types of fats include insulin resistance, elevated blood pressure, inflammation. Now, these typically are not going to be included uh, in, uh, in a regulatory toxicology study. You know, maybe one of you thought your substance was going to cause inflammation, you might be able to throw in a uh, blood measurement of C-reactive protein or some other uh, inflammatory marker. But again, when you start getting into these types of questions, it's they fall outside of what you see in repeated dose uh, guideline studies. So when you look at the typical study design, and again, I'm being very simple, uh, simple in my approach here, but you typically would look at traditional approach for a food ingredient, regardless of what it is. You would have a control group. And again, this is repeated dose toxicology study. You'd have a control group, another group that gets a little bit, Another group gets a little bit more, and another gets a lot. And you know, low, middle, and high dose groups, typical, typical three, uh, three doses. And what you do is hopefully from this study design, you be able to identify a level where no adverse effects occur. That becomes your no observed adverse effect level, and you can use that to apply uncertainty factors to derive an acceptable daily intake. And as a standalone with food, with food ingredients, it works pretty, pretty well because oftentimes the studies. Uh, that are conducted here are uh, several orders of magnitude higher than possible human exposure. You can use your exposure modeling and applications to demonstrate that your exposure from applications you want to use are going to be below the acceptable daily intake. And in most cases, this usually satisfies regulatory requirements. If, however, you're saying, well, we think that the substance we're using, let's say an interesterified oil, is safer than a trans fatty acid. What you would be able to do is take your study and compare that to, again, I'm using the word ideal here. This is, um, I think most of us realize this doesn't happen, but you'll have a corresponding study that was done with the study, the, the substance you want to reference. And it was done for the same duration in the same animal models, the same amount of exposure at the same doses. And this does happen occasionally. And if it does, you can go ahead and derive your ADIs and just see how they compare. Now, this isn't common, but that's, Probably because in most cases there are differences in study design between the study that you want to run and the one that's already been run, whether it's a simple matter of um, test, you know, sub route of administration that can be different. You know, some substances will give a different response if you dose by gavage as opposed to dose in the diet. And so uh, just 
or another possible, I mean, that was a possible option you could have. Uh, again, this is if you want to say your product is safer than another product, is you would have your typical control, low, middle, and high dose, and include in that study the, the, the test substance against which you would want to reference it at the same doses. So you could have a controlled within study and you could do a, a very good uh, comparison side by side this way. Obviously, there are some significant problems with this because you're going to be repeating a study that most likely has been done with these, so animal welfare is not going to like that. It's going to be about twice the cost if you're doing a typical uh, subchronic study. That's going to be probably in the range of $200,000. And you get up to three additional groups, you're going to be getting close to four. So that's going to be pretty expensive. It's going to be complicated. You're going to have regulatory issues. And so it's unnecessary. And uh, short of perhaps some studies where you can see people comparing the beneficial effects of different types of dietary fiber, you're, not, you're probably not going to see this in too many toxicology studies. Then again, it's related back to some of the um, some of the effects that have been reported with uh, interesterified oils and other other types of fats, and let's just say an animal model of insulin resistance. There are specific animal models that you can run to test for this. You can then test your fat with a low, middle, and high dose, and again derive the same variables you would with any other toxicology studies. The problem with these studies is that oftentimes they're conducted in academic settings, and so it's nothing necessarily wrong with the study or design. But because they're an academic, they're probably not GLP. And because they're not GLP, regulators probably will not accept them. And they'll probably also include uh, other non-standard variables that are going to be difficult to uh, describe if you see statistical differences. And so you might be left with uh, some, some experimental observations that are going to be hard for regulators to accept. And so there is uh, some, some issues with that as well. So when it comes down to it, this, this is sort of one way to look at the grass approach for interesterified oils is that you've got the square peg in the round hole. Uh, the classic doesn't fit. And um, however, we know that it has been applied successfully. So if you think about it this way, you can see that if you, if you take a hammer, you can get that thing to fit. And so that's a, a little bit of how the, the grass approach would apply to interesterified oils and substances the use of, of this nature at relatively high concentrations even. And so, Conclusions then from a very brief discussion today is that the principles, general principles of grass assessment are applicable for safety assessment of food ingredients, including interesterified oil, and you can find them in the FDA grass uh, notification database. However, more specialized studies and cl perhaps clinical trials even will be necessary to determine whether they are actually safer than trans fatty acids. And so this concludes my portion of the presentation today, and I thank you for your attention, and I turn the microphone back over to the organizers. Thank you. At this point, I will invite the uh, speakers as well as the panelists that are going to be on video and web webcam to turn on their webcams and their audio. While they are all getting on, we'll go right away and get started. Um, welcome to the panel dialogue on avoiding health flip-flops in a changing food supply. We're going to be focusing on uh, who is responsible and also on effective approaches to decision making. I'm Barbara Lyle and I'll be facilitating this interactive dialogue with the aim that at the end of the session we're prepared with some ideas, they can be half-baked, course, um, about how to address this important question. And the emphasis here is on actionable outcomes because everything that we discuss here and all the comments that you might post in the chat or in the questions section, we're going to take back to our IFINS, lipids and protein committees. And in the next two weeks, they're actually convening and going to be discussing what we can be doing action-wise to address this question of the long-term um, nutrition consequences when the food supply is undergoing change. And I think you just uh, saw from Brian's talk that uh, that grass is not simply the answer to everything, that it doesn't even ask some of these questions. And I think you saw in Sarah's talk that there are research tools and smart ways to answer these kinds of questions, but we have to be clear on who owns the uh, 
uh, the questions that need to be asked and what are the effective approaches to actually employing those answers once you've researched them in decision making. So with that, I'll go to the next slide. Courtney, do you want to move me to the next slide? Here are my disclosures. Um, the intention in this, sec this session is to engage everyone. So we have some people on video that will be speaking. We have some additional stakeholders um, specifically posting questions. So if it looks like I am multitasking, reading things, it's not my email. I'm actually reading the questions that are coming in and trying to figure out where they should be inserted in the discussion. And finally, you can go to the next slide, Courtney. And finally, we want to engage audience participation. And that will come in two forms. The first is to submit your questions and comments in the question box. The second is to everyone to go now onto your browser, on your phone or computer and um, open up the polleveryone.com link to the IFINS Connect 300 that is in the top right corner of this slide. Once you do that, you will be able to respond to both some uh, multiple choice, but also open-ended questions. And again, I'll be taking all of the comments that are posted in the open-ended section back to the pro Protein and Lipids Committee. Because again, you know, in any session you're in and you're investing your time in, you either want to learn something or come out of it thinking differently or having some sort of actions. And I think this session is an emphasis on the last two in my mind, the way it was designed. So hopefully you are thinking differently already, but also that we come to some form of action. And that takes bravery in proposing things that could be done differently. Next slide, please. Uh, I should also just note as a time factor here that if we go over our 40 minutes, um, if we use our full 40 minutes, we are going to go over the time that it shows on the schedule. So if you have to leave, I understand. Thank you for participating, but we are already anticipating we'll run a little over. Uh, Courtney, back one slide, please. Sorry about that. So introductions of those who are on the screen. I'm not going to ask everyone to introduce themselves because you can see their names and you can see on the slide here who they are. So in addition to our speakers, we have two representatives from Health Canada, William Yan and Maya Villeneuve. We have um, a person from the commodity area, which is Matt Pekoski. So he speaks to things from Whole Foods and Ag Perspective along with nutrition. And Dennis Kim, who is a uh, food formulator with a lot of experience. Uh, additionally, as I said, you all are invited to participate. Now we can go to the next slide where we will kick off our participation. So in the upfront speakers, we did use interesterified oils as the case example of how you would ask questions and conduct research on the long-term nutrition consequences of a change. And we also discussed whether or not grass answers the questions about long-term nutrition consequences. But at this point, just to get you thinking more broadly now beyond just interesterified oils and to other changes going on in the food supply, we're going to start with this vote about alternative and plant-based protein foods. And and what kind of long-term health effect. And again, it's the effect on human health we're talking about here, okay? So the results are coming in, kind of a loaded uh, option A, isn't it? It's got a little of everything. We still see a lot of people though, a quarter of, of the respondents are thinking that it's gonna be mostly beneficial. Um, whereas the first one said some people will benefit, but it would be neutral or negative for the majority. Fascinating, isn't it? Because you all are knowledgeable about this, but the consumer out there is hearing very clear messages to eat a plant-based or alternative protein diet, and they don't know some of the trade-offs that may be occurring for certain subpopulations. So I'm going to just use that as Open your mind to more than just interesterified oils, and it looks like we have a group that understands some of the complexity already. All right, now, next slide, please. So I just want to quickly set up some stimulus for um, how it is that the food supply might vary. Uh, sorry, I'm setting a timer for myself here. Um, 
and then how, how does that kind of play out into very specific actions that occur? So if you think about the things that Deanne talked about at the, in the very opening, there are many stimulants to changes in the food supply, everything from health policies to consumer choice, cost, environmental agriculture, really wide. And that will affect who actually makes decisions about the long-term nutrition consequences. Um, as well as the downstream who is affected by those uh, stimulants, right? So if uh, a health policy is to make a change, the egg system, the ingredient suppliers, the companies that are making foods, they all have to make trade-offs in terms of everything, not just that one recommendation. It's not just a simple do this, it's, oh, do this within the context of all the trade-offs I have to make within the system I operate on. And all of those trade-offs then result in the food supply uh, changes and the foods that consumers are ultimately uh, choosing from. And I don't want to go in depth on all of these, but I do want to just use one illustrative example of what happens when uh, food formulators, Courtney, next slide, um, when food formulators have to look at all these trade-offs. So, for example, they're looking at everything from consumer priorities to cost, supply chain, manufacturer safety. Dennis is here. He can set us straight later and maybe give us some examples. But the one I wanted to point out as a top driver that is just a reality we have to face when we're talking about food supply changes is that taste by far exceeds any other driver for consumers. So if you are making changes in the food supply, they have to deliver against consumer taste expectations or they won't be there in the marketplace to deliver in the future. So I know, Deanne, you showed this as well, but 82% of Americans in 2021 said that they're out of five, a uh, score of five, the top uh, two priorities, uh, four or five counts, and 82% of people said that's what their key driver is, right? So you can't compromise on that one too far without uh, losing the ability to even sell a product, right? So these are the trade-offs that we all have to recognize and talk about that are happening, and maybe some of the health uh, effects are trade-offs as well. Um, so anyhow, let's go to the next slide. I also think that it's very helpful to reflect on the past and learn about what, what happened as a consequence um, to the food supply and to consumers' food choices and ultimately their health so that we can then do better now as we're facing the new food supply changes going on, like the alternative and plant-based protein emphasis and the alternative oils that need to replace partially hydrogenated oils. Next slide, please. So to give you an example, potential uh, starter scenario, if we go back to the slide where I had talked about the stimulants and picked just one stimulus, uh, I picked health policies and recommendations. So here is a historical example where it was very clear health policies and recommendations were to eat a low-fat diet. Food companies reformulated, just giving one example, I'm sure there were a lot of things that happened in the ag food supply as well, but ultimately, it led to food companies reformulated on a large scale, and we had a lot of low reduced non-fat foods and beverages that consumers then selected from and achieved to varying degrees a lower fat diet. But no one really asked, you know, how were those substitutions going to be made? What were the formulation changes? What were the consumer decisions about those changes that actually affected the long-term consequence of eating, quote unquote, a low fat diet? And so the questions you'd ask is, did we really have the beneficial effect on body weight or cardiometabolic health? Um, and when we consider that as nutritionists, we say, well, that's okay, we're evolving, we're always learning. That's not how the consumer sees it, right? They are losing trust in us as a food supplying system and as nutritionists because they see this as flip-flopping, right? First, you told me to eat a low-fat diet. Now you're telling me that I did that, and instead I should have been eating a moderate-fat diet but having more unsaturated fats, and now you're telling me it should be a plant-based diet, and frankly, I've flip-flopped so many times, I don't even know where to go anymore, right? So why is it important that we do this? It's important because we want to keep consumer trust in the advice we give and ultimately in the foods that they buy and the food supply that they're eating from. So 
With that, I am a simplifier and a person who likes to make sure we move to action. So I know this is audacious, but I want to get people to put together everything we've we've heard from our speakers and using this as a stimulus to really ask the hard question of who is responsible to make sure that decisions like this to reduce fat or change types of fat or protein result in a beneficial effect or at least is neutral, right? I mean, okay, that's that's bad if it's going in the wrong direction. Um, and then I think we can also integrate into that once we know who is responsible for that is to say what would be an effective approach for them to take. And I doubt it's a one size fits all, but uh, you have to kind of link the two of who's responsible and what are effective approaches for them. So we can go to the next slide. Ah, so this is where we start again getting some engagement with our, uh, our both our panel and our audience. Um, one of the things I'd like to have people distinguish between is primary responsibility and secondary, right? So it starts with uh, primary, like who really owns this uh, kind of out of the gate? And then we're going to get to the next question a little bit, which is going to be who are all the secondary people? But if we're giving out uh, diet policies and recommendations, who, first of all, has that primary responsibility to make sure that the advice given, the way it's given, um, is actually going to result in a benefit? We have 100%. I don't know if that's because only one person voted or, <laughs> or that, that doesn't show on my screen. I don't know. Just pause and look at this. If you pick other, we're going to have the next slide. You're going to get to type in who you think is the other person. Last chance here. So interesting, I personally thought that there were going to be more people saying it's the food company's responsibility. Uh, so that's very interesting to me that they're, you're really looking at the primary source. All right, let's go to the next one. And Courtney, you can skip the next one because no one selected other. So yeah, okay. So now uh, if we think that the organization that develops policies or recommendations is primary, now you can select as many of these as you want, but who has secondary supporting roles? I'd be very interested to see if anyone has ideas on some of the other groups. Great, okay, we're getting at least one response there. All right, we're gonna to go to the next slide and anyone who typed other or who didn't vote for it, but now says, oh, I wish I had, I have another idea. Please enter your responses here, it's open-ended. If who else has some secondary supporting responsibilities? Consumers, that's an interesting one, yep. So I think it's interesting, consumers who need to follow recommendations, and I the challenge on that one is what happens when they do follow recommendations and the recommendations themselves don't uh, uh, end up, you know, changing on them. So we can we can talk about that at some point. News media, that's a new one too. NGOs, consumer activist groups. I think researcher scientists is interesting too, right? Asking the right questions. And uh, I think Sarah had said the who, the what, and the how to research it was important. All right, I think we're settled on that. Let's go next slide. All right, so at this point, I'm going to now open the discussion specifically to those, uh, the speakers and the panelists who are on screen first to answer 
their perspective on who's responsible and what approaches. And you're welcome to either answer one or answer both of them together. And I'll just ask you, give me a little visual cue as to who would like to speak next. So I haven't, we don't have too many overlaps. So who'd like to go? No one wants to go. Maybe I'll I'll I'll, I'll go. <laughs> Thank you, Will. You no, know, just get started. Um, I, I guess just to put it in perspective, so both May and I are going to be speaking to you a little bit from more Health Canada's perspective. So, um, I know Brian did a really great job to explain the the grass process. So just for those of you who are not familiar in Canada, we don't have a system known as GRASS, but so the closest we use is basically our novel food regulation, which basically used a very similar approach as what Brian described, looking at anything that would be considered novel in the food supply, including all the examples that you've heard about today. Um, the way I would position it is that when we look at a novel food, it is really a safety assessment. So we, we look at whether that novel food is safe for consumption. We we do pay a little bit of attention on any potential benefits or something like that, but but the focus is on safety. More the, the benefit will come into whether there's a health claim attached to the food or something like that, and that's taken into consideration elsewhere. So when we look at safety, again, as Brian talked about, we, we definitely focus on things like, you know, the toxicology, allergenicity, the usual chemical microbial hazards, those are the easy ones. What we're focusing on today, the more the long-term effects that you know you have a look at whether it's going to shift the dietary pattern, how it's going to replace other things that are being consumed. We do our best to to look at those as well, but obviously those are much more challenging. And as Sarah pointed out in her presentation, you know, whether you, whether you look at population-wise versus individual considerations, that's something that we, we always have to struggle with. But in most cases, as a regulator, we, we do have to look at more a population basis. So we take all that into account to decide whether a novel food should be approved. Now, Barbara, to your question, I think to me, it seems like it's a little bit of how we look at it. You know, the, when we call it, flip-flopping because we change our mind as data comes in, as you know, our food supply changes. Flip-flopping has a, a negative connotation to it. But you look at the other way around, actually, you can you can spin it and say actually it does a good thing that we're not just approving a food once and then assume it's going to be safe forever. We are actually looking at new data, looking at new information, and we may have to adjust our decision down the road as the food supply, as the eating pattern changes in the population. So I would I would think of the regulator that the flip-flopping sometimes is actually a good thing that we're actually, you know, being current with the science and with the data. Now having said that, how do we do that and 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 who should do it? That's a really good question. I think probably everybody has a role to play to some extent. All the group that was mentioned in your poll probably all have some role to play in that. Um, just my last comment before I, I pass it on to others is that I remember this is not a new question. I remember when I was involved, oh, probably about 50, 20 years ago now almost, when we're looking at establishing GM food safety assessment through the Codex Task Force, there was always the question that was asked that we had to ask, should we be asking for long-term post-market monitoring data for GM foods? And at the time, the consensus was that for what we call the first generation of GM foods, where most of the changes are for, you know, pesticide re resistance and things like that, we didn't see a need for really long-term monitoring. But back then we said that looking forward, if GM food are going to get into more, you know, intentional modification of the nutrient profile of a food, such as oil, then long-term monitoring may be appropriate on a case-by-case -case basis. And Fast forward to today, we're, here we are, 
not necessarily GM, but any change in the fatty acid profile oil or whatever it is, maybe we do need to look at more long-term monitoring and making adjustments when we need to. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, so I I really um, appreciate what Will just said. And I guess what I, I found this really a challenging talk to put together and, and I finally have realized somewhat why. And one is you have food, you have food ingredients that get end up in multiple foods and then you have dietary patterns. And when we think about things like trans fat or you know, plant-based proteins, we're talking about multiple foods changing. So we're talking about changing dietary patterns and many different country com uh, companies involved in many different types of foods. And the question you have here isn't that question. This question is cell culture protein, right? It's not talking about all the other protein al um, alternatives. So bringing one ingredient or one food to, to the market is different because you may not be shifting the dietary patterns across the population in quite the same way as guidance that we're getting from health agencies and dietary guidelines, et cetera, to make this big transition, you know, in, in terms of fats, for instance. And so you, you may pick a variety of different choices because now you've really shifted the food supply in response to needing to meet those choices. So I, I think, um, you know, how, how do you um, balance that? Because we're talking about what you know, the safety of, of individual foods that fit into a pattern, but where we see the flip-flops is when we change the patterns, I think. And I think we'll address that at some point as well. And in terms of monitoring, I, I do think, you know, I don't know if we can avoid flip-flops per se, but I think we, we need to monitor, that's for sure. So I think you're you're making a good point here, which is that the who is responsible differs depending on whether it is a specific individual ingredient being used in a specific food application or even wider spread versus a, a widespread general dietary recommendation. It seems like two different things, though. I will say that the widespread dietary recommendation is often the trigger and the stimulus to the individual ingredients. So. Maya, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I think there's another aspect we have to be careful when we talk about flip-flops. Sometimes it's not necessarily flip-flops. Sometimes it's more the advice, the recommendation, the dietary recommendation is misunderstood. Uh, for example, yes, there is a recommendation now to increase plant-based protein and so on. But in Canada, the dietary uh, guidance also talk about uh, limiting the consumption of processed food. So when they talk about plant-based protein, they're really referring to legumes, not necessarily uh, transformed products that may not have necessarily, um, I would say, a nutrient profile uh, that is better than their counterpart, their animal counterpart. So I think when we talk about responsibility, um, the the, the agency, the group, the government, or whatever who's making the recommendation has a responsibility to clearly communicate it. But the stakeholders, whether it's the health stakeholders, whether it's industry, uh, media, they also have a, uh, a responsibility to making sure that those nuances are well understood to the consumers. So um, I think that's where we have to be careful with the flip flopping. I think sometimes it's a uh, it's misinformation or misunderstanding of the dietary recommendations. Um, Barbara, okay. something, something I just wanted to pick up on, it's more a general point that uh, some you mentioned about consumers and about actually are they following the advice? And I think this is something that we often forget and there's a lot of criticism on population-based guidelines on the food industry. But research actually shows that less than 10% of people in most countries are even following their you know, national uh, advice panels or population-based advice. And we, we've done research at King's and I know other institutions have where they've looked at, are there improvements if we take people following their country's typical diet versus putting them on their recommended diet for that given country? And you see huge improvements. And it's just a, a kind of general comment that I wanted to say that we're just not following uh, guidelines. So we have to be mindful of that. And 
something else again that's quite a general comment around the flip-flops that I think that as we move beyond looking at nutrient-based um, evidence and as we use food based evidence, I think we're going to see less and less of these flip-flops. I know we're talking about ingredients and the ingredients are obviously added into the food, so there is that added level of complexity. But I think, you know, a lot of the flip-flops, unfortunately, are around us very much as nutrition researchers in the past focusing on nutrients and not really giving full appreciation to the fact that there are very complex nutrient-nutrient and food matrix interactions and that these are actually really important. And so I, I do think as we move to more individual food base, we'll start to hopefully have less flip-flops and really be able to have a clearer idea in terms of the guidance. So I want to interject with a few comments that have come in through the uh, submitted questions as they relate to this. Uh, one is someone else reiterated what you said, Sarah, that keep in mind most Americans do not meet the recommendations in dietary guidelines. Uh, it's not that they... Um, they followed the guidelines and they didn't work is that they didn't follow the guidelines at all and still don't. Um, also, um, I think we've been talking about flip-flops and risk analysis and how that plays out maybe for individual ingredients. Uh, we have a comment here that's important to note that flip-flops are actually part of risk analysis and that there's a fairly large literature on these trade-offs. Also that um, FDA economists, for example, asked the question about would replacing trans fats with, uh, when mandatory labeling was considered. So it's part of their regulatory impact analysis. Um, I'm not sh sure I am familiar enough to know whether that really got into some of these longer term health benefits or not, but that's a great place to go look and see how well it did. And finally, also another point here about, uh, Sarah, you talked a lot about what's important, the individual or the average. And uh, so a question is, when is the inter individual variability in response to a food or ingredient large enough so that the recommendation based on an average response does more harm than good? And I think this gets to like, who is responsible for doing that? And that's part of an approach that they would probably we want to include, right? Anyone want to comment on those? Matt, did you? Yeah, I think, uh, thanks, Barbara. I was, you know, in part to some of the questions you raised, but I just had a follow-up comment to some of the comments that the other panelists have raised thus far and tying back into the two questions you've posed here for us to discuss. And I think you know, while fundamentally and from a prioritization, I do agree with what many of the respondents to the questions you posed in the poll um, stated was that I think the, you know, primary responsibility or kind of top of the, you know, multi-layered approach starts with policy and the government agencies that are responsible for, you know, setting the policy and guidelines, you know, here in the U.S. every five years. But that being said, um, I think the coordination of a collective um, work and effort um, with the sole purpose of developing science-based and yet actionable guidelines needs to be um, considered, and I think area and for improvement, right? So Maya's point um, you know, regarding recommendations around increasing plant-based proteins in the diet and really probably, um, you know, some challenges on the educational side of things with the public that, you know, what does that really mean? And what the scientists and say, you know, health professionals that are knowledgeable, how they would interpret that is obviously different than how consumers are interpret that. So how, how can we get a more coordinated approach from where, you know, the, you know, starting with the review of the scientific evidence from the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee to then the interpretation of that evidence by, you know, in our instance, the USDA and then translation into the policy document. And then that also is then, you know, reflects uh, recommendations that are made in, the, made in my plate that are supposed to be for consumers. And, you know, I do think, um, you know, with the, I think all the speakers in the presentations raised such good points on the complexity. Um, I think the you know last point I'll make is the you know really need to have a coordinated systematic research plan to try to approach this because heterogeneity in study design and you know really just leads to you know a much slower process along the path of trying to answer these fundamental questions. 
So I'll stop there. Yep, Sarah. I think something else, again, just a general point to think about is the added complexity around processing and that this can have such a huge impact. And again, when we think of food, sometimes we might not consider this. So when you think of something like porridge oats, whether they're whole rolled oats or they're family ground, can have a vastly different impact on things like blood sugar that may go on to obviously have differential health impacts. And this is just picking up again, like Matt said, on the complexity and the difficulties we have. And I think that when we're thinking about individual ingredients, they typically will go into a food, obviously, that has been processed to a different level. And whether it's going into a moderately processed or ultra processed, that's a consideration to be having as well when we're thinking about the health effects. We had an interesting insight come in on the questions um, section, which is if you think about what happened with COVID and masking and how changing advice uh, clearly reflected what we were learning in the moment in the health profession, but uh, not sure if that actually led to increased, decreased, or no change in consumer trust in science. But I think it's a very interesting uh, you know, an obvious example of how do consumers view changing advice? Do they trust it because they think, oh, I'm getting the latest greatest, or do they distrust it thinking, you people don't know what you're talking about, right? So I think this whole area of communication um, is one that uh, probably deserves to be carefully and thoroughly included in any way that we address this topic. And Barbara, I think that's a huge problem. Oh, so, sorry, Matt. Go ahead, Sarah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I think that's a huge problem. We did some work as well, looking at the level of trust that people have about communications and what nutrition scientists um, know and what the food industry say. And the mistrust out there, I think, is part of the problem of leading people to look for these kind of silver bullet solutions with actual kind of total nonsense from whether it's media personalities about what to eat. But also, I think it's really created a general feeling of mistrust towards the food industry. And I think it's a very unfair feeling of trust, you know, and also a mistrust to nutrition scientists that, oh, we don't know what we're talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If yeah. I could build on that, yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because I've thought of that uh, exact example, my own, over the past, you know, <laughs> eight months or more of how this has all played out. And those who, you know, and and I guess rightfully so to an extent, right? The average consumer, you know, may not be aware of how science works and how it's a continually evolving process and how, you know, particularly when you're talking about public health, recommendations are made with the available data at the time with an effort to best reduce risk, right? There are, you know, very rarely absolutes. The answers are very rarely black and white, and we very rarely have 100% certainty. Um, and obviously we see the distrust and such that plays out and, you know, science and those that are setting policy around science fall victim to that. I think one um, thought that comes to mind on how to mitigate that a bit is, you know, and I think even in the dietary guidelines process, you know, it seems like there's more of an emphasis moving toward this is the transparency with which, you know, the decisions are made and the data from which these decisions are based on. So when decisions and recommendations are put out there, I think if there's an opportunity, now granted, the question becomes how many consumers will actually go look into that information, but being as transparent as possible with this is the, this is the data or this is the science from which those that were experts in this area made the recommendation. And if recommendations are updated, you know, or a you know, flip-flop is the way we're talking about it today, right? you provide a bit of rationale as to why that change was made. Um, so I think, you know, granted it's it's not gonna be uh, an all encompassing solution, but it was just a thought as one potential solution is to being as transparent as possible, educating consumers that science is a continually evolving process. And yes, you have to have a bit of trust in, you know, those that are, you know, experts and are have had, you know, 20, 30 plus years of training to do the best they can to evaluate the data and make recommendations. But I think transparency is a big piece of that. 
Yep, Deanna and, and Courtney, can you go to the next slide? In the meantime, we'll take Deanna as the last comment here. Yeah, and I think communication is is very important. It does seem that when we're making policy and trying to sell things in, often there are promises made. You can save X many lives if you make this change, right? And yet I don't know that we go back and say, and we actually did save those lives because I don't know that we can actually make that um, deliverable. And so, you know, where we're, um, policy communications tend to be um, very one-liners that are trying to drive for, you know, getting people on board. So they're very advocacy. And um, I think that that is challenging. And to what Matt said, you know, people don't want to hear, well, this can benefit some people, but most recommendations won't benefit everyone as we get into precision nutrition. And it's getting more complex. But we don't, you know, how do we communicate that complexity without losing the consumers or without them even being less motivated? You know, I think that's a, a big question. Yes, thank you. So we're going to start wrapping up here. Uh, we got a couple of minutes here left, and I'd like to get some input here. Again, we're going to be taking all the input that you've ha uh, provided so far. Uh, so while the votes are coming in, I want to go back to two specific uh, comments, questions that came in that were specific around interesterified oils. So vote away while I ask Health Canada specifically to answer the question of, in Canada, would every case of interesterified oil be assessed? as a potential novel food and then in general if any of you in in the group uh, with audio control here know the answer to how common is consumption of is interesterified fats in the general diet that's another question related to interesterified so why don't we do health canada's response first and then anyone who wants to answer the second question would be great um, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll start, Mayor. Maybe you can you can add to it. So it, it's a little bit tricky to answer that because our novel food regulations is a very broad regulation. So our definition has to capture everything. So I guess the short answer is, is on a case by case basis. It all depends on whether the modification takes it outside of the range that you would normally expect that particular oil and the fatty acid profile. So if there's already a counterpart that has been modified and you just you know, tweaking it a little bit that may not become novel whereas if it's the first one to be modified is now completely different than what you expect that oil to be then it will be treated as a novel food and furthermore if it's approved it's probably going to be have to be take on a different name so that consumers and everybody know that this oil is now different than this counterpart that it was modified from so so it's a little bit of a case by case all right, thank you. And a general use, Sarah. Um, so this is something we did quite a lot of research with as part of our interesterified work together with ADM. Um, there has been some work published previously, um, again with ADM in the US looking at this. And we did some modeling work using our UK data set and there's work being done using the NHANES as well. And we find that it's currently in about uh, it's currently accounting for about one percent of our total energy intake. So assuming that we have between 30 to 35 percent of our total energy intake from fat, it's contributing about one percent. Now, what we did see though was that there was huge variability in intakes between individuals, and this depended on things such as socioeconomic factors and also age um, uh, as well. So the, the, there were people in the upper quartile going up to about, sorry, I'm just looking at the data as we talk, about 3%. So it went from quite low to about accounting for 3% of total energy uh, intake. Thank you. And, and Court, oh, yeah, oh, uh, Courtney, it looks like we've settled on the results here. Sarah, did you have one last thing to comment? I didn't want to cut you um, off. I was just going to say where we're finding this fat. So we also did work to look at what the main food products, and we found that about 55% of the interstirified fats in spreads, about 33% in bakery products. And um, just to give you some context of where we're getting the interstirified fat from in our diet. Okay. Okay, so the results have settled. And uh, for anyone who's looking at the screen, there were two that are pretty much the lead contenders there with dietary guidance and recommendations being based on realistic consumer ideal uh, behaviors rather than idealized recommendations. 
and second that we need to start doing some realistic scenarios uh, before and tested in human populations before broad food supply changes are rec implemented. So with that, Courtney, you can go to the next slide and the one after that, actually, you can go to the next one. There we go. So we are 10 minutes past the half hour and very shortly now you're going to have the privilege of uh, hearing from uh, Jason Losk and Ricky Yada as they have a let's talk together. And I also wanted to just invite anyone who is interested in this topic to the topic we just talked about, um, not Ricky and Jason, um, <laughs> to just send me an email because as I said, I'll be working with Matt and Dennis and the lipids and protein committees to figure out what we can do to improve on who is responsible for making these decisions about long-term nutrition impact impact and um, how we can provide tools that will help them be effective in doing so. And so an email to me and I will put you on my list for we'll stay in touch and figure out what your interest might be and how it could intersect with what the committees will be looking at in the next year or so. So thank you to the panelists, to the participants and to our speakers. Have a good break and we'll see you back for the Lex talk in a few minutes. <music>